A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, a ray of light set off on its journey through the universe. For seven billion years, this light traveled through the vast, expansive voids of space and time. But its path got twisted and turned by the gravitational pull of all of the invisible dark structures around it. Now, in the last nanosecond of this ray of light's life, it was caught by our telescope. It bounced from mirror to mirror to be consumed in our camera, and moments later, appear on my computer screen. Wow, isn't it stunning? Now, for the last 20 years, I have been catching light in remote mountaintop observatories all the way around the world. I've been recording billion-year-old messages from over 100 million galaxies. And right now, you're probably thinking, wow, she must really love galaxies. Those gorgeous, glorious, glittering whirlpools of stars, these beacons of light in our cosmos. Yeah, you, you'd be wrong, actually. I really hate galaxies. <laughs> I, I don't care about them at all. You see, galaxies are worth nothing in comparison to the invisible dark side that is the true master of our universe. The reason why I've spent so much of my time collecting all of this light is because I want to interrogate it to find out about all of the darkness that that light has passed on its journey to planet Earth. Let's take a moment now to think about the stuff that we do understand. Right? As scientists, we understand the stuff that we are made up of. We understand the air we breathe, the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, these beautiful galaxies that you can see. We understand all of that. But if we've done our sums right, everything that we can see in the universe accounts for less than 5% of it. Less than 5%. And the rest, the other 95%, is invisible. We can't see it, we can't touch it, but we know that it's there because of the effect it has on the things that we can see. Now, we have some good theories about this dark side of our universe, and it requires there to be two different entities. Our first entity on the dark side we call dark matter. Now, dark matter is the strong gravitational force in our universe. It likes to pull and clump everything together. Indeed, our own Milky Way galaxy, our home in the universe, is housed in a massive clump of dark matter that ensures that all of our stars in our Milky Way galaxy are nicely glued together. But dark matter has a bit of an evil twin, something that we've called dark energy. And this dark energy seems to be this mysterious, evolving source of energy in our universe that is causing our expanding universe, it's causing that expansion to get faster and faster each and every day. Now, this amazing theory explains a lot of the observations that we can make of our universe. But I'll be quite honest with you all now. We don't really understand it which is a little embarrassing to confess that, as scientists, we don't understand 95% of our universe. And uh, you might be thinking right now, well, that's, that's a bit of an epic fail, as scientists, to not understand 95% of the universe. But I'd rather think of this as an amazing opportunity for discovery. Because when you don't understand something as gargantuan as 95% of the universe, it means that you are missing a key piece of the puzzle. It means that we need to rethink our understanding of physics. And it's very widely believed that our final understanding of these dark entities within our universe is going to have to involve some new physics that's going to forever change our cosmic view. It could be that Einstein's theory of gravity isn't quite as perfect as we currently think. Now, I'm sure you can imagine when your job is to potentially disprove Einstein and his theory of gravity. I'm sure you can imagine this is quite a competitive field in science. Yeah? There are lots of international teams around the world with their own ideas, their own heartfelt beliefs, their own experiments. 
um, all competing with each other. Now, five years ago, my team was the first to map out dark matter on large scales. For five years, we collected light from millions of galaxies, and we interrogated that light to tell us where the invisible dark matter was. Here's the map that we made. I want you to imagine looking up at the night sky and holding your palm outstretched. The map you can see at the back there is about the size of your palm up on the sky. The hot spots that you can see there is where there's lots and lots of dark matter, and as the color scale goes down to the blue, that's where there's less and less dark matter. It was extremely thrilling and exciting when we got this result, and it was almost what we expected. Dark matter clumps together. Gravity makes it clump together. But it turned out that actually dark matter was a bit more of a smooth operator than uh, people had previously thought. It wasn't quite as clumpy as people expected from this theory of there being just dark matter and dark energy in our universe. Um, now, what an exciting day it was, and I was really looking forward to going and sharing this new exciting result with my colleagues that might inspire them to, to really rethink what they were doing. Was I going to get a Nobel Prize? <laughs> no. Was I going to meet hearty skepticism? Yeah. Um, what I wasn't expecting, though, was very aggressive levels of criticism. <clears throat> Catherine, can you please tell the audience what you've done wrong? Senior, very uh, well-renowned physicist, male, asks young, junior, female scientist uh, in front of a very, very large international audience. Well, I, I, I froze. I absolutely froze. I uh, couldn't say anything. The last five years of my life zipped past my eyes. What have I done wrong? 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 I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me whole. Now, I'm sure you've all met criticism at some point in your career, and don't get me wrong, criticism is really important. It's how we develop, it's how we learn, it's how we grow. It's really important. But what does aggressive criticism do? How does that impact our lives? Well, I can tell you how this experience impacted me. It made me absolutely hell-bent on never, ever disagreeing with the establishment ever again, which means it's, it's not great, because uh, if one of the potential outcomes of your work is to prove Einstein wrong, and let's face it, Einstein is like the biggest cheese in the establishment, uh, then, then maybe this experience isn't really where you want to be. Let's fast forward now five years to the present day. I'm now a full professor of astrophysics. I've quadrupled my size of my galaxy collection, the methods and techniques that I use to interrogate that light, to tell me about all of the dark matter. I've improved the precision and the accuracy. But still, in the back of my head, I can hear that voice, what have you done wrong? I can feel the panic rising in my chest, and I know when I do my next analysis of my data, I'm going to have to make some decisions. How can I be sure when I make those decisions that they're the right ones? How can I be sure that my decisions aren't being impacted by this unconscious desire to agree with the establishment? How can I be sure that my decisions aren't biased? Now, we all, every single one of you, have your own unconscious biases that affect your everyday decision-making. It's very well documented now that because I'm female, you're less likely to trust what I'm saying than if I was a man saying exactly the same thing. Luckily for me, though, there's also been some recent research that said that tall people are more likely to be trusted than short people, so it's probably cost-neutral uh, for me. Um, but what can we do in our lives to make sure that our decisions aren't affected by these unconscious biases? Well, the way we did it for my team was we collected the data, uh, but then we created two other fake data sets. We shuffled them around, and only one person knew which was the truth and which two were the fakes. We analyzed all three data sets, we mapped out the dark matter, and we made very different conclusions about the mysterious dark side of our universe. We wrote three versions of our scientific papers, and only when we were absolutely ready to publish 
Either of them did we find out which one was the truth and published. This is a beautiful dark matter map that we made from our most recent survey. Imagine looking up at the night sky again. This one's now the size of your elbow to your fingertips. And um, I'm pleased to say we found something very similar to what we found before. Dark matter seems to be a bit of a smooth operator. Maybe there's a third entity out there in the universe that we need to explain these observations. But to be really sure, I need more galaxies. And so I'm very excited that next year we're going to be opening the domes of a brand new telescope that's currently finishing construction in a mountaintop in Chile. This is the Large Survey Synoptic Telescope. It's going to be imaging the entire southern sky every three nights on repeat. That means we're going to be able to map out all of the killer asteroids that may one day obliterate planet Earth. So don't worry, we astronomers are looking out for you all. But with this amazing data set, we're also going to be building up the deepest image of the universe that's ever been taken on these large scales. And with over a billion galaxies, we're going to be mapping out the dark matter over the entire southern skies. We're going to be able to confront a wide range of theories to hopefully explain what on Earth is going on in the 95% of the universe we don't understand. It could be we draw such radical conclusions as there being extra dimensions, perhaps a new fundamental force, or perhaps... Einstein's theory of gravity isn't quite as perfect as we think. But if we come to any of those radical conclusions, you can be sure that we have done our analysis in a blind way and that it has not been biased by any of our internal beliefs about what we feel and what we want. Thank you very much.